Holy Day celebration. I, I request uh, the director of uh, Triple Eight Hyderabad, Professor P J Narayanan, to start the program with a few initial comments. Uh, P J. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the second FC Kohli Day celebrated by Triple Eight and the Kohli Center on Intelligence Systems set up at Triple Eight. So the Kohli Center on Intelligence Systems or KCIS was established in 2015 at Triplet Hyderabad with significant endowment from TCS Foundation to uh, honor uh, Mr. F.C. Kohli, who is the pioneer of uh, the IT industry in India. Um, and you know, we, he, we, have, we have much to learn from him, how he, how he took up on the opportunity or grabbed the opportunity to create this outsourced software development uh, and the entire IT industry was grown, grown, grew out of it. So this is a significant you know, development in India's history itself, uh, posterity will say. But you know, we had the opportunity to interact with Mr. Kohli in connection with this a few times. I, we invited him uh, to the center and his answer was, I will visit you as, on, as often as you would invite me. And then he took a lot of interest in the projects happening there. And one of the things that was very clear, uh, that comes through very clearly from uh, Mr. Kohli's attitude is that he wants, of course, the technology research to develop uh, as best as anywhere in the world, but he also wants it to be applied to the society. So he was always keen on whatever pro things he did, he asked us, he was very, very passionate about the adult literacy program that TCS ran for many, many years. And he would repeatedly ask us about how to contribute to the language technology research for that, how to use language technology research, that is automatic machine translation, other things, to help the judiciary of India. Some of these projects we are taking up now at KCIS with funding from TCS and other, other sources. But the, I think that it is very clear that Mr. Kohli's uh, his passion was to use technology for the benefit of the country, and there is much can be done. We have made it start. We mean the country has made a start, but there's a long way to go. So I think to remember FC Kohli on his birthday, March 19th, which is his birthday, the KCIS, our center, decided to celebrate it as FC Kohli Day annually to reflect on what we were able to do and to keep reminding us of that mission that, you know, academic institution, academic research is very good, but we should do the best we can in academic research, but also look at how it can translate to real problem that people in this country have. And as I, am, uh, as I often say, the problems of the, the, the lower end of the society, the poor or the uh, uneducated, are much harder than the problems that we have, that people like we have. So I would like to challenge all the, the students and the researchers to say that the weak of heart those who are not courageous enough attempt problems of the of the well uh, well healed people, people like us. The strong of heart should be taking up problems that the rural poor India or the world needs. So that is the that, that that's the mission that we want to be part of. Uh, we have an interesting program lined up, as uh, you would see in the for the next few hours. I can see a, a good panel and an interesting dialogue with some of our uh, alumni who would, you know, who has made an impact and so on. So uh, I welcome you all to this second uh, FC Kohli Day, uh, 2022, uh, and I'm sure you will enjoy as much as I will. Uh, back to you, Madhav Krishna. Uh, can Nimi, uh, would you like to introduce the panel? Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so let us uh, begin the event with this uh, very, very exciting panel. Uh, so I will request uh, Anup, uh, Dr. Anup Nabudri to uh, introduce the panel and uh, set the ball rolling. Over to Anup. Thank you, Nimi. Uh, so welcome to all of you. It's a wonderful uh, panel that we have 
and I'm really excited to to have to hear about the views of our panelists about various topics of AI and its applications and implications uh, when you apply it to society. Uh, I'll for no other reason I'll just go in alphabetical order. So our first panelist is uh, Anu Acharya, Anuradha Acharya. She is the founder and CEO of uh, Map my genome and also before that uh, Osimum Biosolutions, and uh, she is uh, entrepreneur, technology leader, thought leader, and has built up a solution that is extensively used now. She is awarded the Young Global Leader by World Economic Forum in 2011. Uh, she's graduated from IIT Kharagpur, followed by uh, MS from University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, I would. After this round of quick introduction, I'll ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves in terms of a little bit more detail about how, uh, about their work and their thoughts. So I'll not spend too much time on everybody. Uh, so welcome Anu to the panel. Uh, thank you for uh, agreeing to be on it. Uh, second, we have uh, Srujana Mirugu. Uh, she again is a graduate from IIT Madras, and after that, did her MS and PhD from University of Texas at Austin. Uh, she has had a very interesting career. She has worked as a machine learning researcher in Google Research and currently at Amazon, but she's also done volunteer work with uh, the COVID Data Science Consortium, where she volunteered as a research lead and also done several other consulting oriented works. So had a wide variety of experience in use of uh, ML solutions in uh, real world systems. I'd be really glad to hear from you also, Dr. Shujana. Uh, welcome to the panel. Thanks, Thank sir. you for being here. Uh, third, we have uh, Rahul Panikar. Uh, again, just in terms of his education, he graduated from IIT Madras and then did his uh, PhD from Stanford. Uh, she, uh, sorry, he again has been, uh, uh, a very important, uh, very strong presence in the technical uh, and thought leadership in the areas of AI and it's especially in terms of its application in problems that affect the society. So starting from his PhD work, he has uh, worked with underprivileged kids, uh, healthcare for them. Uh, he was uh, did extend that work uh, when he was the research lead uh, at uh, Wadhwani AI, and now uh, he's currently working with uh, Vicarious, which is actually looking at much larger and deeper problems of applications of AI into robotics and artificial general intelligence. Uh, welcome, Rahul. Uh, love to hear from you again. Uh, then finally, we have our own uh, Dr. Vinod. Uh, many of you might know him, uh, but uh, he has been working in systems biology, which is uh, a pretty complex area of biology, which I don't understand much. Uh, but interestingly, he has been able to, to combine not just uh, basic biology, but also computational techniques into it. So he's one of the brave, brave souls who does uh, venture into the, uh, the two areas and try to dive uh, deeper into it and try to create research solutions from uh, both biology and machine learning together. So welcome, Vinod. Uh, I'd like to again hear from you directly. So as an initial round, uh, I would like to ask each of you panelists to talk a little bit about yourselves, your work, and uh, what your thoughts in that direction are. Uh, we will probably go in the same order, starting with uh, Anu Acharya. Uh, hi, everyone, and um, thank you so much, Anup, for the kind introduction. Um, I, so I, I've been a, an entrepreneur in the genomic space now for about 20 years. I started off uh, in, in a company called Osimum Bio, where uh, quite by unusual design, I think I, I stepped into it from coming from a physics background. But having been there, I think uh, it was around the time the Human Genome Project was getting completed. Uh, it was uh, a fascinating area of, uh, of you know, just inquiry and understanding of human being, you know, just understanding of who we were. And I think that was primary motivation to actually get started in that field. 
Uh, over a period of time, of course, uh, Osimum became one of the largest genomic services players worldwide. We had done three acquisitions, one in the US, in Netherlands, and in Germany. Uh, and, and we built, you know, uh, you know, we had what we called as a research as a service model. But uh, having looked at where the whole field of medicine was moving, uh, and we felt that that was where, um, you know, precision medicine was, was coming into play and that we should no longer restrict it to something that large pharma have access to and, and only the large, I mean, re, large research uh, entities could have re access to. So we felt we should make it easy to be able to get to one sixth of the world, which is the Indian population, to be representing in what we believe is going to be more personalized and predictive uh, for each individual. So I think that was the whole uh, idea behind starting Map My Genome. And we started off with a small single product called Genome Patri. And over the period, over, over the last seven, eight years, we've been able to add on many more pieces, uh, dimensions to it, including uh, using machine learning to sort of solve a much bigger problem, which is uh, in terms of looking at understanding at health in general. So that is in very brief detail, we do a lot of work in terms of uh, clinical genomics and also uh, have been a pioneer in the consumer genomics piece. And this is where we use a lot of um, algorithms, uh, a lot of uh, machine learning to be able to come up to where we are today. So I hope that gives a brief introduction of what we do. Thank you, Anu. Uh, next, uh, moving on to Sujana, even though I messed up the alphabetical order, that's fine. Uh, we'll I was wondering through. about that, but uh, you know, thanks, Anu, for the warm introduction and also for inviting me to this panel. And uh, hi, everyone. It's, uh, you know, it's a great pleasure to be here celebrating uh, FC Coley's Day and this phenomenal institution. I've had a chance to work with some of the students from uh, IIIT at Tabad, and it, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure. Uh, you know, all those interactions have been great. Now, coming to today's uh, panel topic, right? So when I first got to know about this theme of applying AI and new frontiers and directions, the first thing that uh, came to my mind was like looking back on how it was two decades back, right? And I got into machine learning almost 25 years back. And this was all thanks to my undergrad advisor. This is uh, Professor Hema Muthi at uh, IIT Chennai. And at that time, it was very different. And I would say it's like an understatement to say this field has actually come a long way. And at that point, my undergrad thesis, when I first got into it, was on building um, hidden Marco models for index speech recognition. And uh, as you can imagine, once I got into it, right, and I started understanding the possibilities, I was totally hooked. And just a few days back, I was interacting with kids in a government school, and they had this Google Home device in their classroom. And the kids were talking to the device to get help with their math homework. It was an amazing thing to watch. And it just brought home to me the reach of ML, right? Like all these models and all the things that we built. So just wanted to convey that, you know, this was part of that journey. And uh, and again, to be fair, it's not just machine learning because we had this perfect storm of uh, kind of situation with, you know, huge advances in data management, internet, computing, platforms, all coming together. And that's why we have this massive transformation of our society. And I would say right now, the pace of innovation has also accelerated. So it's like really a uh, wild new world. So I'm like pretty excited for us to be discussing about the, uh, you know, the directions that uh, could emerge going forward. Now, coming back to my own journey. So during my grad school days, I worked mostly on theoretical problems related to unsupervised learning with fragment divergences, quantification of privacy, privacy preserving algorithms, and so on. And uh, then I moved to industry research, and that was a slightly different world. We still worked on ML problems, but the emphasis was on connecting them to some real world, uh, you know, problems like recommendations, information extraction, uh, linkage of records in databases, forecasting, and so on. And around 2015, I left Amazon because I was very keen on trying to work on problems uh, that had a solid societal impact. And I spent a few years with startups and NGOs uh, working on problems related to education, healthcare, and financial inclusion. 
I also happened to overlap with Rahul at Vajwani AI, where we worked with government agencies and so on. And uh, over the last uh, one year or so at Google, as well as Amazon, we've just seen because of the COVID situation, right? There's this enormous focus now on healthcare. And I'm mostly working on problems related to automated digitization of health documents, modeling human physiology and psychology, control of dynamical systems of all sorts, including the human systems and conversational assistance and so on. So that's a little bit about myself and yeah, really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Sujana. Uh, over to you, Rahul. Thank you, Anup. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting journey. Quick background of mine, as Anup mentioned, um, got my PhD at Stanford, was like Sujana, was at IIT Madras before that. Um, I've, I've, throughout my career, uh, since grad school, I've, I've looked at uh, applying technology to global scale problems. Um, so I've been an entrepreneur and I've been a, uh, I've been a technology innovator. Um, so as an entrepreneur, I've, I've built, I've built, built and led organizations. So that's one thing I do. And the other is uh, build important technologies. When I talk about important technologies, it's, um, I'm reminded of something one of my investors, Vinod Kosla, uh, mentioned. That is that most uh, most things that are valuable are hard. Not everything that is hard is valuable. So I try to pick, uh, and that's, that's just advice I'd pass on if there are any students out there. More, I try to pick things that are not just hard, but also valuable. And through this, um, my first, uh, through my first company, we developed an incubator that works without electricity that has today helped over a million babies across 25 developing countries. Um, and in fact, they're currently being shipped to both Ukraine and Russia to help babies there. I was the chief res uh, research, uh, part of the founding team and the chief research and innovation officer at the Wadwani Institute for AI. And there we develop AI solutions for cotton farmers that are currently being used across 2,800 villages in Telangana and um, led to a bumper cotton crop last year. Uh, and we've built solutions for uh, non-invasive diagnosis of TB, um, AI solutions for identifying low birth weight babies and so on. And I presently am the advisor to the CTO and the principal technologist at Vicarious AI. Yeah. So Vicarious is a startup in, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley um, with the stated goal of getting to ubiquitous robotics and uh, artificial general intelligence, They're backed by Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and lots of the big names. And uh, yeah, happy to share more about the journey. But um, through this, I think I've, I've tried to be a technologist, but also a responsible one, um, because uh, I think it's the days when we as technologists could say, I only do the technology, you know, how it gets applied is not in my control. Those days are gone. I think all of us bear responsibility for the consequences of our creations. And I think our conversation after this will get into some of that. So very much looking forward to this. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, finally, we have uh, Vinod, Dr. Vinod PK. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks, uh, Vinod. And uh, I think uh, you know, to be part of this panel, right, coming from an academia, I think I'm really proud of it. Uh, so given my background in engineering and sciences, so I always try to take up problems that could be analyzed from the engineering perspective. So that's how I ended up in taking systems biology as a principal area of my research, where we try to address problems, biological problems from a systems perspective using mathematical modeling approach. And then uh, also expanded into an area of uh, machine learning and disease biology. So we see a complementary approach coming together to generate some useful insights that may be of application related. And uh, given that the systems biology itself is somewhat uh, not very clear, as Anu was mentioning, I just wanted to quickly uh, tell about it so that it wasn't clear to the panel members also. Right. So. In, instead of looking at one gene or one protein of interest, 
that is what most of the time the reductionist approach uh, do, right? We here try to assemble uh, the components, biological components in form of system, and then try to look at how that system dynamic influences say, some kind of a biological function, uh, which could be how cells grow or divide or die. Right? So that's the overall idea that we, you know, we banked on to create nice mathematical model which will try to explain possibly how cell grow and divide, right? And then we also looked at uh, data emerging out of uh, genomics and also all the way down to uh, the clinical data or the patient's data which comes from pathology and also the blood report to come up with some kind of a multi-model learning to generate useful uh, insights and also predictive models that may be of application in data. So that's the overall idea. Uh, with which we are uh, moving forward. So I'm looking forward to further discussion with the panel members and the team here. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Vinod. Uh, let me just uh, start with a set of questions to each of the panelists, and then we will uh, go from there uh, to start with some generic or rather specific questions based on the background. So I'll start with uh, Anu Acharya. So you have been uh, you know, working in this area, which is kind of the, the merger or marriage of two big things that have been happening in the, the industry recently. One is genomics and the other is machine learning and AI. Uh, so could you just give us some comments on uh, what has been the impact of these technologies in the society, as well as how much of AI is uh, influencing uh, genomics and how much of, uh, you know, is there any reverse pollination also happening between the two, as well as maybe the impact of these technologies on the society? Sure. So, so when I think about, you know, what uh, genomics has done over the last, uh, you know, 20 years or so in its existence in terms of since the Human Genome Project was completed, I think the most popular application of genomics has been that of utilizing human curiosity and trying to understand who we are, right? And, and so understanding of ancestry and all. And while that might seem to be a more frivolous activity, I think in the end, I think it, uh, it ultimately boils down to also understanding disease, trauma, ethnicity, and migration, and all of that point of view. So I think that is a very valuable piece of information that uh, on an aggregate level, you can start using machine learning to start getting even better results from it and trying to then correlate it with health and many other things. So that is one part. It starts with curiosity. And I think most places, I think that's where it starts from. Um, the second uh, element uh, is uh, what I would, you know, the way I look at it is the kind of problems that you want to solve that are more uh, in the hands of the consumer, that the consumer has the ability in some ways to be able to solve these problems, um, whether it is through better diet, nutrition, and all of that. Now, there you are, you're trying to use genomics as something that will help you understand some of the risks but you can also then ultimately use other data types to help you in sort of making that better. And uh, I think Dr. Vinod also mentioned, but it has been one of our um, main goals is to sort of marry these pieces of information together, whether it is um, uh, the biomarkers, your lifestyle and, and, uh, and genomics and put all of that together. So we have done that for cardiovascular diseases, for, for um, diabetes, and we're doing that to sort of do a completely combined overall looking at how to put use machine learning to sort of bring that piece together. The third, I mean, the third kind of things is mostly what I would say would form under the clinical part of the whole puzzle. And in the clinical part, there are two aspects. One is to find out what causes a disease. So you're trying to find new variants all the time. And whether it is uh, searching large volumes of uh, uh, data that is out there on the web or books or, or publications, or it is by looking at large databases and trying to use machine learning to find out those few variants of, of interest that are there that you can then correlate with disease. Um, that is one. And the second, of course, the more clearer um, uh, way that you would use uh, genomic data and also machine learning would be on the treatment side, which is trying to find out, especially so on the cancer side, right? So you want to be able to use that for um, doing tre for treatment purposes. 
there are also other other areas where you would use um, AI in genomics and is um, basically looking at things like liquid biopsies. You want to find out very early stages of where you can find with a little piece of blood, you can find out the circulating tumor cells. So you're trying to find out if there's any trace of cancer or you're trying to find out what the primary cancer in a particular uh, uh, person's uh, you know, blood is or, or trying to find that out from this liquid biopsy. So that could be one. You could also use it, for instance, other interesting parts of when you look at genomics and things that we are not yet fully doing would be to marry uh, imaging with, uh, with genomics. And, and there are, uh, those are areas that at least I'm very interested in is to put that, you know, looking at MRIs and, and genomics and putting those two pieces together uh, to be able to come up with a better way of predicting, uh, you know, predicting disease and managing disease. And of course, there are other more interesting, fun things like, um, can you look at a, um, a morphology of a person or a, of anywhere else and looking at the genotype, phenotype correlation actually come up and reconstruct uh, what your genetic risk might be. So it could be going from one way to the other. So, and then there are CRISPR and, and other gene editing tools and how machine learning can be useful in that. So at least in the space that I'm in, I think we're pretty much filled with examples of hundreds of kinds of things where you will need to use uh, machine learning um, one way or the other because you just cannot look at uh, 90 gigabytes of data um, you know, for, for a whole genome sequence or otherwise to be able to make sense without having, used, uh, without having to use machine learning in the first place. So I hope that gave some sense of what we are doing in, in the genomics space with AI. Yeah, it's a very fertile and exciting area. Thank you. Uh, uh, I will now move on to Rahul, maybe just uh, to correct my <laughs> alphabetical cluttering back. Uh, so uh, Rahul, you have kind of a very interesting uh, background and you've worked in areas of AI primarily in healthcare and uh, especially with uh, the children and in uh, poor communities. And from there, you have now moved on to some kind of uh, the other extreme, if you want to say about talking about robotics and uh, AGI, which is uh, kind of uh, extremely uh, high-end or latest and greatest kind of technologies. Uh, so uh, could you just uh, comment on like, what, is, what would be the impact, what you see on this, uh, of the latest and greatest technologies that you you are now trying to to achieve in uh, its impact on the society or even uh, specifically if possible in the lower end of the society when would such an impact happen and what would what do you think those impacts would be right yeah no happy happy to share and uh, by the way alphabetical order i just assumed you were going by alphabetical order of last name so that's okay <laughs> Uh, the uh, yeah uh, to me uh, I don't I don't necessarily put a transitive order on these things. Uh, I uh, the problems that uh, when I the problems that we I was working on before my uh, current assignment were extremely challenging in a different way, and actually those are um, those are lessons I bring to what I do now. So, for example. Uh, I'm, I mentioned having to develop reliable hardware products, right? Um, that now, now we are mentioned uh, we, we're shipping to war zones, and this is not the first war zone we've shipped medical products to. Uh, previously, did this to Syria as well. Um, so, uh, building technology for underserved populations, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one. And part of the difficulty, much of the difficulty is not technological. Much of the uh, difficulty is in uh, the human systems required around them. And I think most of us who deploy technology in the real world will see that that's one of the most challenging parts because, you know what, in many ways, technology is in our control and we can change it. It's very hard to change human systems, right? Uh, on the other hand, human systems do respond to any interventions you bring about. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one to model and change. Um, and, uh, and plus, as technologists, it's not something that we've, We've generally had too much academic training on. Uh, the uh, since then um, we have also looked at you know applications of AI to um, 
to some large scale global problems of underserved population, right? So for example, one of the technologies we developed at the Vadbani Institute was for um, uh, identifying newborn babies, right? Uh, low birth weight newborn babies who are missed across the world. About 50% of them are actually missed, not weighed correctly at birth. Right? And so we developed the technology where, and meanwhile, frontline healthcare workers have been given smartphones. Um, and so, uh, and this is thanks to M Health initiatives, digital pipelines have been established. So we built a technology where they could actually take a short video of the baby and uh, from that estimate weight. Um, there's a number of reasons this is why this is attractive. You might think that, hey, why not just send a spring balance out there? It's very easy. We spring, you know, the global health world has been trying to do this for close to 20 years, hasn't worked, right? At least 15 years in India, we've been doing this, hasn't, hasn't worked. We still miss half our low birth weight babies. And it's supply chain issues, um, data quality issues, uh, cultural taboos, and so on. So the global health world has been, I mean, this effort was supported by the Gates Foundation, um, was, uh, and we had support from Niti Aayog and so on. So yeah, people from the problem uh, domain really appreciate the potential of these technologies. I think the, the key aspect to keep in mind is um, in building these solutions, one really has to understand the problem across the stack. Right? not just at the level of, say, a healthcare worker or, uh, or in a rural home, but one also needs to think of, well, given this information, how, um, how will a primary healthcare doctor react? Who will make the deployment decision? Who will ensure that um, you know, systemic biases are rectified, right? or at least flagged? Um, where will the funding for this come from? Who will ensure data quality? And so on. So, how does this integrate into existing practices? Right? How does li how is liability affected? And so on. There's one has to. That's what I call thinking across the stack. Right? And this is this is also true, by the way, in the in the commercial business world. Right? One has to think of deployment. The and one of the reasons I actually am currently doing um, robotics is it's actually there's actually two motivations here. Um, when I play this out far enough into the future, right? If I take the next uh, 10 or 20, uh, 20 years, I expect robotics to be a tremendously impactful technology for our species. I, um, lots of things will get automated. Um, what robotics brings the possibility of is automating not just things in the world of bits, but automating things in the world of atoms. And um, so that's, uh, and it has the potential to bring about great abundance. For us, but only if done right. Otherwise, it will uh, only if we ensure that that abundance is distributed equitably, that power is distributed equitably. So I, I want, uh, and and that's why I chose to actually uh, work in that space. And there's also a scientific motivation here, right? which is, of course, uh, for many of us technologists, um, getting to human level intelligence through algorithms is a holy grail, right? and that is. Um, that uh, that is artificial general intelligence, right? Um, because at that point we're talking about a science fiction future, um, and robotics, in my opinion, actually offers an interesting pathway to get there because uh, the way we reason about the world is not not just correlational; it's actually causal, right? Uh, robots have the ability to intervene in the world. Robots have to cause change in the world, right? That's, that's the fundamental definition of causality, right? to cause change. And um, so robots have the ability to cause change and uh, go, go beyond correlations to, co to causing change. And in fact, you potentially have the ability to do counterfactual reasoning because the, because the physical world can be modeled, right? And that is how we humans reason about the world. Um, no, I, no robot today has the ability to say, I, I should have done better, right? Because to say I should have done better is an expression of regret. And regret is a counterfactual sentiment. It's reasoning about something has a, that has already happened, right? And where something could have been better. Um, you cannot reason about that purely in the language of probabilities. Um, you can, probably given probability x comma y, you can calculate 
probability of x given y or y given x. Doesn't tell you if y causes x or x causes y, right? All of deep learning cannot tell us if symptoms cause disease or disease cause symptoms. Um, robot, uh, robotics is one potential platform to, to therefore get towards AGI through, through uh, interaction and intervention in the world. So there's both of those. Go so over a long enough time frame, I expect this to be tremendously impactful for our species and provide great abundance. That's my motivation. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Rahul. Uh, now let me uh, move on to Dr. Jana. Uh, so you have been, you know, working with uh, a company like Amazon, which is known for deploying things at scale, and uh, you know it's obvious that AI can play an important role when you you try to scale things up. Uh, several aspects of it could be automated by AI. Uh, we obviously know about the standard things like you know supply chain management or uh, inventory control, uh, managing customers, sellers, uh, understanding people's preferences. All those kind of things definitely uh, will involve machine learning, AI, and pattern recognition kind of things. But uh, if you could comment a little bit deeper on what kind of problems where you see, and maybe if possible, some of the not so obvious. Uh, places where AI plays a role in scaling things up. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, so there were like, I think a lot uh, there in, when you asked about it, it's like a very broad question, right? So uh, about AI at scale. And I just wanted to add though that, you know, this is not just based on my experiences at Amazon because I've been at Amazon only for a few years and then again, most recently. But I just wanted us to think about, you know, when we look ahead, like what will the world be like, right? And Rahul spoke to that a little bit on how things could shape up with robotics and so many other things going on, right? Uh, and I, you know, come back to this quote that uh, Jeff Bezos uh, once, you know, shared with uh, folks in an email. This was about like, you know, how the smart business strategy is to focus on essential human needs that won't change. And like people keep thinking about what is going to change, right? Like what will be the next big thing over the 10 years. Uh, but he says that, you know, build your business, build your focus on the things that won't change, right? And, and like, but uh, stay with me there for a minute because if, uh, I mean, there are some elements that definitely are going to change, right? So 10 years from now, we might not know if, uh, you know, Bitcoin or quantum computing uh, will be like, so ubiquitous that everybody will be using it, but folks most likely will still need to eat, they'll still need to sleep, they'll have to access healthcare, education, they'll need to entertain themselves, they'll need to connect with each other, we have to engage in commerce and handle natural disasters. So what I feel is that in some fundamental ways, these will and will and should remain the business of tomorrow, right? Like so the things that we would care about. And um, the modalities and the specifics, of course, will keep changing. And at Amazon, what could change is that, you know, we've gone from selling books to eBooks to videos and podcasts now, and eventually folks might figure out a way to directly plug in a book into their brain, right? And they will get into that business too. I mean, Amazon will get into that business too when it's right. And so we'll have to think about what are the opportunities of using AI at scale in all of these businesses around human needs. And of course, this, like you called out, Anup, some of the opportunities focused on the end user impact, whether it is health, education, or like, you know, supply chain, e-commerce, those are kind of clear. But I want to uh, come back to that part where the scaling aspect, which is the prevalent in all of these big platforms like Amazon and Google, what that gives us, right? So what it really creates is this enormous network effect or economies of scale. And uh, when we think about the last couple of years, we attribute this global transformation to AI ML, but what seems to be going a little bit under the radar here is the how aspect, how did it transform? It is not just through the predictive ability of AI ML or some kind of like, you know, retrospective analysis. And, you know, of course, we didn't have such great control abilities or the intervention abilities still lately. Right? So what has been missing from the discussion is the nature of the platforms and marketplaces like Amazon, Uber, Google, and Facebook, 
and these are designed so that you know two plus two kind of adds to five. And what exactly has happened is that AI has really boosted the matching mechanism. Basically, deploying AI at scale helps us create lots of data, and we also know how to use this data. It, you know, like it ensured that we had this data coming in and we have a mechanism to use it to create like richer experiences for users, to create massive efficiency. Unfortunately, that also has led to huge concentration of power and kind of mixed effects for our society. And so I feel like, you know, rather than going to specific opportunities at an application level, I mean, this kind of overlooked opportunity is actually understanding the evolution and dynamics of these platforms so that we can shape it to be, uh, you know, much more powerful and also much more equitable. I think that should be like for all regulatory authorities, for people at large, right? That should be our big focus area, uh, you know, like a, I mean, in terms of, I'm, I'm like, you know, not just a representative of Amazon. I mean, like as a community, we need to think of that. And, um, you know, apart from the opportunities, I also want to quickly touch upon the challenges, right? I mean, again, the plenty of things that we talk about, like when we deploy AI at scale, we're collecting lots of data, you know, it's valuable data. So there are governance issues, there's security, privacy issues, all of those become uh, very important, right? And uh, of course, we also don't want these systems to go haywire. So we'll need to have these guardrail mechanisms to monitor for unintended consequences, distributional drifts, and so on. And we talked about this, and even environmental costs that are, uh, you know, now a important topic of discussion, especially for large language models. We are talking about all of these, but I feel a couple of uh, aspects that are not sufficiently uh, touched upon in our circles, as like in ML communities, how these large uh, systems. You know, and I build, I'm part of like folks who build these kind of systems, right? But these lead to uh, devaluation of human labor and skills, right? So if a machine could do something and could do something much better than humans, the human is going to be devalued at some point, right? What is that we can intrinsically do, especially if you are not an ML expert? That's one thing. The other thing is how AI has given us these enhanced abilities to create alternate realities. And this is something that Amazon, Facebook, everybody is going to get into and we are going to build these systems, right? We are going to create multiple versions of worlds. We are going to create like very personalized experiences. And what this could do is though, the realities look very different for different people across, you know, I would say like all that spectrums, right? Cultural, economic spectrums. And this could disrupt the social fabric. So uh, these are some things that we need to think about. And we look at like, both the opportunities and the challenges of what's going to come because of uh, you know the work and things that we are doing at Amazon, Google, anywhere. So just wanted to call that out. Thank you. There are so many questions that come to my mind, but I don't have time to ask all those during this particular panel. I'll keep it for some other time. Uh, it's a very, very fascinating set of thoughts that you put out there. Uh, but I'll come back to you again later. Uh, for now, uh, let me go to Dr. Vinod. Uh, so Vinod, you have also been working on problems of very large scale. Uh, you know, uh, molecular modelings are difficult enough. You are working in systems biology, which works at much larger uh, scale modelings. And uh, could you comment on what has been the impact of uh, AI machine learning in the research in systems biology and what are the things that we can do now which we could not have done without a computational approach like this yeah that's the you know a kind of uh, challenging questions possibly to you know, come into picture right because of the, the nature in which how we look at traditional ways of doing science versus say data driven approaches right and i see that uh, you know uh, there's a recent rush to use AI technologies in biological research, uh, partly because to overcome the challenges with traditional approaches. I'll just try to give some examples where you know, this has made a real impact. And also due to the you know, uh, generation of big data in biology. So that's the other aspect of uh, you know, things that are recently caught up with the advancement in high throughput sequencing, et cetera. When it comes to the traditional approaches, I could uh, 
think of one example where uh, the recently there was an example of how you can predict uh, say three dimensional structures from a biological sequences, right? So that's one of the grand challenges in biology, which was uh, recently addressed through AI ML approaches. But then given the traditional approach, how it takes to solve this problem, right? We could see that uh, you know, if uh, traditionally if one has to solve this problem, it takes months, years to isolate the protein, purify the protein, and then crystallize and understand the three-dimensional structure of the protein. But when it comes to AML, by learning from the data, now we are able to generate high quality structures which are very close to the experimental data. So that's the scale at which the impact has come. And also in the recent times, when you, uh, when you were stuck with pandemic, uh, we also had this tool being used to generate data for uh, the viral proteins, which could be basically targeted by drugs. So that's, uh, that's, the, you know, that's the analogy I can give with how traditional approaches can be helped by uh, AI coming into picture. With the other aspects which I watched, what Dr. Anu was also talking about is the data science aspect of it in biology, uh, which seems to be caught the attention of many people, including me. Uh, so, but then it starts from every walk of life, I would say, you know, starting from the data generation aspect of it, right, and processing part of it to all the way down to data analytics and interpretation. So you can see they have been applied to every aspect of it. So for example, when you talk about data being processed, right? So you know that some of these signals that are generated by these kind of sequences may not be directly reading the, the letter code that we are looking for, but then we may need to translate those kind of signals into some kind of biological knowledge that seems to be you know, done with the help of ML. Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, the sequencing as itself as a technique, right? You will see that uh, you know, they are the big sequence, the, uh, the genomic sequence of human can be broken down into pieces and then sequenced in part, but then they have to be reconstructed back uh, using some kind of algorithm, right? So there also we see deep learning approaches coming into picture to improve the efficiency of uh, you know, reconstructing the sequences uh, that could be used for say, detecting some variants or going beyond detecting variants to look at the functional aspects of how that variance affects the physiology. So that's a, that's a scale at which we are seeing uh, AI being used. We also look at other kinds of problems where say, uh, for example, you look at the data that has been collected, we can get data at the multi-scale multi level, right? So you can get data from individual cells, you can get data from tissues, right? And you can also get this data from the patient itself. So this scale of data has given, come up with some kind of a, given us some kind of a scope to look at uh, how AI-based solutions can be applied to look at, uh, say, you know, look at, say, for example, how uh, some kind of heterogeneity that can be there in some of these uh, data could be addressed with this kind of ML kind of approaches. So I see that there's a lot of scope that has come. Uh, specifically focusing on the data side part of it. But then I also see coming from the system side, right? how do we go from uh, high dimensional data to inferring a system from there? And then also trying to look at uh, the, you know, what possibly we look at the statistical dependencies or pattern, right? How do we go from there to come up with some kind of model that possibly you know, explain or come up with some kind of a theory that possibly is important at the end of the day, right? So we most of the time we we spend a lot of time in generating this data and analyzing those data, but then we are happy with some kind of a detection of some useful patterns or biomarker. But then how do I how does that translate into some kind of a theory that has been the scientific principle under which we all operate? So that's the aspect of uh, how I can see that how the AML part coming into picture of uh, you know, systems approach to biology. So I stop with that. Just to wrap up, I'll just ask one question to you. Uh, but uh, when you were talk about this kind of larger systems, uh, do you actually uh, model it differently? Like one, one example that I can think of is that it, the people say that it's you know, very, very difficult to predict the, the weather tomorrow, but it's far more easier to predict the climate as it changes over a period of time because it's a larger system, different kind of models apply. Does uh, such kind of uh, a model 
paradigm shift exist in systems biology where it might be very difficult to figure out exactly how a protein would fold, but uh, as a overall system, you can predict uh, how it behaves much easier. Yeah, I, I think the uh, this uh, question of what you are asking is also applies to you know, systems biology also. Right? All models are wrong, possibly some of them are you know, uh, giving you some insight. So that's the you know, paradigm that we wanted to pitch here. But then in principle, what we are looking at is, is to see how things could be predicted right? based on uh, uh, some set of observations that we have already. right? And then what we are trying to see is that a kind of model can be used as a hypothesis uh, generation, which has to be going back and you know, through a, an experimental cycle where you test it out, right? And therefore you keep on refining the model, right? So that's how we think about uh, modeling plays an important role here, right? So it's not going to be simply a model has been proposed, uh, but that model is not the final model that we are talking about. It gets continuously refined through experiment modeling of the cycle. Right? So that's how. Uh, thank you, Vinod. Uh, so now uh, let's kind of ask some generic questions to the panel and uh, you know try to pick their brains a little bit more uh, on different aspects of AI and its uh, impact on the society. So the first question that I would like to put out is that uh, you know uh, one of the primary advantages of using AI is that it's able to distill information or knowledge or uh, intelligence from the experts in the form of the data and its annotation uh, and distill that expertise into working systems and you know, kind of commoditize or democratize uh, expert intelligence and make it available to the common man. Uh, so in that context, uh, could you comment on uh, how impactful these approaches have been in terms of what has been made available to the common man uh, which otherwise they would not have access to. So maybe I'll start with uh, you, Rahul, and then uh, probably I know you might have something to comment on it. Yeah, right. Rahul. Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, that's certainly one of the promises of AI. And I think this is particularly true for uh, countries like India, right? Because in the in what we call the global north, right, there is a fear that AI, AI is, uh, can be labor replacing, right? And therefore the threat to jobs, right? Uh, and it's a, it's a fair question to ask. And it's a fair question for us also to ask. Um, but there's also many, many domains uh, in the global south where there's a lack, lack of experts. So we have a lack of skilled uh, doctors. We have a lack of uh, sufficiently trained, a sufficient number of trained agricultural scientists, right? Uh, one example, uh, and, and so on. Lots of domains where there's a, a scarcity of um, uh, skill. And so uh, one thing, one, the one solution I alluded to earlier uh, for cotton farmers, early pest detection for cotton farmers, this is something that we've deployed in, um, in many places, including Telangana, where uh, it's been deployed in about 2,800 villages. So it's reached, I, I think, up over 100,000 farmers. And last year, uh, they had a bumper crop. And um, part of that, the government is attributing to the uh, uh, AI solution, which was able to detect pest attacks before, they, the, uh, before the boll worms entered the cotton ball. Right? Uh, now, there's, we just don't have enough agricultural scientists to, uh, to have actually offered this expertise at scale. But hey, we built our models, uh, and, and in fact, agricultural, um, I've, I've spoken to, uh, or I've heard from agricultural scientists who actually get WhatsApp forwards of plant images, uh, and they get like a few thousand images a week. There's no way they can actually respond to all those messages, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, we, yeah, and, uh, and in this case, uh, uh, but this was done by models that were compressed so that they could run on generic Android smartphones, offline inference. You know, the models, in fact, we compressed sufficiently that they, uh, the, the, size, the memory footprint of the model was smaller than the photograph that they clicked, right? It was, it was less, than, less than an MB or so. <laughs> so things like that are possible today. And I think those hold 
um, tremendous potential, right? Scaling, scaling expertise. What we have to be careful though, however, is we are not scaling all parts of human expertise, right? Uh, the, our, our AI algorithms are still brittle and um, they are not very good with out of distribution uh, inference. And mm -hmm. so, for example, object detection models trained in one region of India doesn't eat, automatically work in another region. One, one that trained for Telangana doesn't automatically work in Tamil Nadu or doesn't automatically work in Varda. That's not necessarily true of an agricultural scientist, by the way, right? So we are not, mm -hmm. we should also be cautious about there's only certain parts of human expertise that we are able to scale today, but that will improve. Maybe Thank if you, I Rahul, can. Uh, no. Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So one is, I think, you know, um, sometimes we, we limit ourselves to where human expertise lies, right? So for instance, I think when you look at healthcare, we are, we are basing our uh, thought process on, you know, today we live up to, let's say our framing of our question is, uh, you know, let's say the average life expectancy is 72, we want to increase it to 74 or something that is tangible, measurable in the way we currently uh, look at the problem. Um, you can also look at the problem in a different perspective, which is to say that if you had access to machine learning and you had access to data, could you frame the problem differently? And you can frame the problem differently because now you have access to be able to solve a problem in a, from a different perspective altogether, which basically says that instead of framing the question as, can I increase the lifespan from 72 to 74? I want to say, can we make it uh, a healthier and a more better quality of life? And therefore your outcomes are going to be very different, um, for instance. Or you could, you could frame it in a different way where you're saying that, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, your early intervention of diseases is, is done faster. So instead of, you know, 80% of the cases that currently uh, look at cancer at stage three, can we actually change that problem to saying, can we look at it at stage one? Ultimately, I think it's better quality of life. But I think it is also in terms of how human beings frame questions. And when we do look at uh, machine learning and we look at AI, are we just trying to make it a faster, cheaper version of what we already are? Or are we trying to actually do this in from a completely different dimension? I think that's that's one question I think everybody should think about when, when they're looking at uh, systems, building solutions. So just connected to that, I would uh, tag on another question that, you know, so uh, most of the systems, as you just suggested, that we are trying to approach human intelligence. And uh, there are some certain limitations as to human intelligence in terms of annotations that we get. So uh, is there any way in which uh, artificial intelligence systems has, can go beyond human intelligence uh, which, you know, can we overcome the limitations set by the, uh, the, the quote-unquote experts who has labeled the data and uh, given to it? Do you have any specific thoughts on that as to how we can go beyond that? Or if somebody else would like to pick up also, Srijana, you can uh, talk about it, it's fine. Yeah, I can go after, Alun. Yeah. So I just, I'll keep it short in the interest of time. So I just wanted to say that typically, right, we, when we collect data and label data, there, there tends to be editorial disagreement. So what we try to do when we are trying to build models is actually get uh, multiple passes of uh, down on the labeling, basically have multiple people. And in case of medical domain, this would be like multiple doctors looking at it, people with possibly different levels of expertise looking at it and there are bound to be areas where they disagree, like say even on something like cancer, tumors and so on, it's not like they will all agree, right? But once they sit down and discuss, they identify areas of disagreement and then they resolve it, uh, then the labeling tends to become better, right? So that's not a single uh, human's judgment, it's a consensus judgment identified through a process, right? Through a very careful process. And so, uh, that sort of data, right, is going to be, you know, much more, I would say, uh, like a stronger uh, holy grail for us to adapt to. And in terms of, um, you know, models that you build, you can definitely get better. And there is this other bit that, you know, I think Rahul and Anu also were talking about earlier in our discussion that sometimes we are trying to build these predictive models 
for an outcome that is going to happen much later in future, right? So we would also have a different side, uh, type of ground rule uh, that we could you know, be measuring ourselves against. And if such longitudinal data is captured, you could definitely do better than the human experts. I mean, I'm just, you know, repeating one of the discussion points that we all had earlier, but yeah. So, sure, absolutely. But uh, related to that, this one of the audience have asked a question from Tupal Kashyap. He has asked, uh, is there anything uh, specific that you need to watch out for when you are trying to do data collection from the larger masses, especially non-English speaking and native population, when we are trying to collect data? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that as to any yeah, I mean, any I insights? think Rahul also would probably have this. I mean, you know, we probably have very similar experiences. So there is this M Health app, and there used to be this Care app, which uh, uh, Asha workers used to collect uh, data from, you know, folks in village in rural areas. And there, of course, you know, folks don't speak English. So the kind of it would really need to be very careful about the design of that UI, right, for data collection. So first of all, you want to make sure that it's a lot more uh, visual and pictorial and you know, there's very little ambiguity when, when you're collecting data. So if you want to figure out like, you know, something about uh, cough symptoms, there should be a visual that kind of clarifies all the differences an explanation in local language. So ideally, if you have like visual or spoken interfaces with additional explanations, that's one definite best practice. The other thing that tends to happen is incentives, right? So it's, it's not just about the illiteracy, uh, and you know the communication gap. If you don't have the uh, incentive set right for this data collection, then the data tends to be noisy. And Rahul alluded to the point about like a uh, lot of low birth weight uh, babies not being captured. That's because it's hard to go home to home and you know capture all the data. So it's easier to just mark it as 2.5 kgs and get done, right? So that, that's what happens. So that's another thing that people have to be mindful of. There should be a mechanism to verify if the data is being captured right and also have the right incentives both ways, right? Positive and negative to um, you know, make sure the right data is collected. And this is much more, but I, I mean, Rahul, you want to add to that? Yeah. Anu, any one of you? Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's a big topic. I can probably write a book on design research in community settings. I've, I've done it for north of a decade now, uh, but I, I'll maybe share one or two points that have not been touched upon. Uh, in general, when when we collect data in a in a community setting, where, uh, there's some uh, I, 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 please be aware of the significant power dynamic, a power imbalance involved, right? Uh, and you need to have appropriate checks and balances there. So remember, their data is theirs. You have no right to it. Okay? Uh, and moreover, it is even unknowingly, it is easy to be in a situation of coercion. Okay? And therefore, when collecting data as far as possible, try and go through a reputed ethics committee and get your processes reviewed for one. Um, the second thing I'd say is um, uh, because you do have to, uh, like any research data, you do have to uh, protect your participants. Uh, the second uh, second thing I um, yeah, uh, the second thing I'll say is um, try and uh, take a partner along in, who has trust of the community, who knows, who has local context, and uh, uh, who and therefore will be able to see things that you won't necessarily be able to see. So for example, if you're doing research, try and partner with an, uh, with an, with, with say an, on, an NGO who operates in that area, right? Or any other organization that operates in that area, it, they're a bridge for you and uh, the community, right? Um, otherwise, lots can be lost in translation and uh, you can walk away thinking that you have high quality, when much of it is uh, really, really, really doesn't mean much. And the expensive part of that is that the data is nonsense will only show up when you actually go in for field trials and then you realize that actually, you know, your 
uh, your, your results were based on sort of incorrect hypothesis. I could keep going, but I'll pause. <laughs> Maybe I, I can just a quick example. Um, Please, sir. Yeah. Two, two things. I think one, when what uh, uh, Rahul mentioned was taking a trusted partner along. I remember when we did a couple of zero surveys in states and, and Karnataka, I think we went with, with a partner that knew the community well and had done this many, many times before. So we use CMIE to be able to collect that. that. The second thing that, that uh, also brought about by Sujana was that of value. And when we think about uh, our incentives rather for, for the data, and I remember that you know when we look at most of the time when we go to a, a diagnostic center or a, or a hospital, we're giving the least amount of information because you want to get done with it quickly and you want to go away. Because ultimately all you want to see is your final report and you want to go away with it. But instead, I think when we look at what we are doing, we are providing value to the consumer, which is saying that if you give me this information, then I'm going to connect that and I'm going to make it create something of value for you. And I think that's when the consumer is more interested in it because at least they're getting something back from, from that. So a good quality data comes when there is an attached value that whoever is involved within collecting or giving is going to be providing that data. That was a great point and a very important one, yeah. I, I was gonna say the same. You don't want data collection to be an extractive process. You want it to be participated. Yeah. Mm. Very good point. Yeah, thank you. So uh, now let just want to ask a couple of challenges uh, in uh, uh, AI and machine learning in applications. Uh, maybe we know you can uh, comment on this one. That are there any uh, some of the key lim technical limitations that is stopping the adoption of AI in your field? And do you see some way to overcome this in the near future? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the uh... With respect to the medical domain, right, itself, right, so we think about uh, developing algorithms, which is kind of a black box, right. So, being a person who comes from you know, mathematical modeling and trying to understand uh, what is happening inside the system, that right? AI will always kind of, you know, looks like a black box modeling, right. And therefore, there is always there is a transparency that we talk about in doing these things, right. It's always going to be an issue. That has to be tackled, and that's, of course there are techniques that are being proposed to for an explainability or interpretability of the model. Right, so that has been uh, always a kind of a thorny issue for any of these problems that we are looking at from the medical domain. The second issue is the you know the uh, the data itself, as we were discussing about in multiple days. Right, so one of the thing what we can think of is uh, collecting data right in the context of you know, Indian population, right? So if you ask me any kind of medical data that has been systematically collected or if it's available, like say, for example, UK Biobank or IDPCGA, right? I wouldn't say that there is a, such thing exist uh, in the Indian context here, right? So which means that we are talking about developing technologies which are mostly driven by the Western population, right? And then, uh, but then when you, when you want to adapt to the Indian sitting here, right? Do we have a really a data which is possibly available for the community to work on, right? So such a gap exists in the system right now. And uh, of course, as, as we were discussing, as what uh, Dr. Rahul was saying, is that you know, we were we are going through that process of creating such a biobank, right? So where we are trying to go and talk to the stakeholders there and trying to bring collect data that is possibly clinical as well as uh, and also image images that possibly comes from pathology or uh, say for example a photographic image right? that is for example an oral cavity photographic image could of be of unique uh, value to the system right so such data sets are not available but then creation of those data set is going to be a big challenge that one has to you know overcome to um, no, come up with some solutions that possibly have some Indian context to it. So that's one of the challenge I personally feel when I am doing any work related to medical domain. So where we have started some of these activities, but then uh, I see a big roadblock in terms of uh, establishing or not establishing the ethical clearances or getting some kind of regulatory clearances to do such kind of work. Right? That roadblock 
is always there and then i see that you know can be a kind of you know barrier to anything that we move forward with it. so that's the that's the view i wanted to add to thank you we know in that context uh, rahul you had made a point before that you know the like not just in the case of medical data but overall uh, systems that we develop tend to be uh, dominated at least in its conception by the the global north and uh, the global south and india gets uh, it, it's only an afterthought uh, that uh, with the kind of problem so uh, do you have any comments on how we can go about uh, thinking from first principles as to how we look at problems uh, of that is relevant to the south yeah yeah i um so i think uh, i i wasn't trying to just to be clear i wasn't trying to put down the importance of the work that the global north has done and its foundational work right in much of this uh but we it is important to contextualize as an example when we talk about bias right uh the kind of biases that are are typical in the in the conversations in the west are not necessarily the biases that uh, uh that are appropriate for us they're not then for example they're not necessarily about race however they, they a lot of it is about socio economic uh, strata um you know uh, religious communities uh in a uh, caste and so on. these are these are traditional biases that have exist existed in a long time uh and these biases show up not in um, not just in data but also in choices of therefore what problems to solve uh, where does research funding go right whose problem are we solving right we, the source a lot often in when in questions of bias it's the popular notion is that the bias comes from the data right uh, true a lot of the bias comes from the data but actually it is important to look at the full ml cycle right and if you had more time i'd get into it but there's a very nice diagram by parish dekhani uh, that shows the full ml cycle and actually where um, biases come in it starts all the way from deciding what problem is being solved and therefore whose problem is being solved right power structures automatically play there all down to evaluation where who do we evaluate with are underrepresented communities being evaluated on right as part of test sets and field evaluation otherwise you know lack of performance in the uh, for those populations never even show up right so the uh, this this plays out at many levels and it's important to contextualize in our setting another thing i'd mention is um a lot of the problems um a lot of the work in ml in the west has been done either in academia or in web companies right and web companies are typically direct to consumer uh if we look at service delivery in india especially in for social impact okay a lot of it is actually through intermediaries so you have the notion of front line health workers you have the notion of you know education through teachers um agricultural extension workers and so on right um, a lot of service delivery is intermediate uh and so uh, th that actually adds uh complications to the problem so whose problem are we solving uh, uh who's where do we account for biases do we account for biases of the farmer do we account for biases of the uh, extension worker uh, the agricultural officer uh, the state uh, or the state officer who actually makes funding decisions and so on there's, there's a suddenly the pro problem problem starts uh, getting much more complex maybe the last thing i'd say is we should not take digital literacy for granted right uh di digital literacy and access should not be taken for granted uh digital literacy remains limited it's growing but remains limited um we should not be fooled by what we see around uh, our own bubbles and uh, access to phones for example still even uh, we talk about uh, there being much greater access, deployment and access to phones but much of that access um uh, especially in rural communities remains with men right women have far lesser access to phones right so it's it's actually not uh, uh, any form of equitable distribution these are the sort of problems that have uh, these are the sort of, some ways in which we have to contextualize problems 
for the global south. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, we are running short of time, so I am taking the liberty to extend the time a little bit more. Uh, next event starts only at 3.30, so we have a little bit of slack. So I'd really like to use that time to pick your brains a little bit more. So as a last uh, question in this direction, uh, many of the audiences here would be students uh, who are you know, looking at uh, research problems, or they could be thinking as uh, potential entrepreneurs once they graduate. So do you have any comments for people who want to pick up specific problems in your field, uh, what, what, what could be your guidance, your advice to them uh, in terms of either picking up a research problem or picking up a problem to, to do some entrepreneurship? So I would open it. I think uh, uh, Srijana, I know Rahul, all of you might have thoughts on it. So we'll keep it short. And then we will. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Yeah, given it. But I, I think it's an important question and, you know, something I would like to talk about. And I, and I would rather than go to a specific problem, let's maybe like, you know, step uh, back one level and think about the skill set, right? And Rahul also was talking about it earlier in the discussion about, you know, problems that are hard and problems that are like really impactful, right? And that set is not exactly the same. And so that's uh, something for folks to dwell on, right? So when we typically come across students, and I'm just speaking again as uh, like a, someone who has mostly spent time in industry research but has worked with interns, and so what I see is that students from top schools have like really uh, good knowledge on ML techniques and theory, and they also nowadays have great hands-on skills with like ML frameworks, like munging data and so on, right? But what I find missing is uh, what Rahul kind of alluded to the holistic view, right? The full stack or, or thinking across the stack kind of mentality, right? So that is something that seems to be a little missing. And I feel that is the thing that, you know, folks should try to develop. And for every project that you do, you want to like, you know, take away some meta level learnings on how would the whole process evolve right from the point of problem formulation itself right like validating the problem prioritizing across problems right? because just because it's technically challenging doesn't necessarily mean it's an important problem and again depending on a setting right like if you're if the uh, reason you're taking up something is because you're doing it for your own learning then of course by all means pick a challenging problem but if you are trying to do uh, like create impact in the world, then the criteria might be different. So, like thinking about the different types of criteria that matter, and how to prioritize a problem uh, from among the different options that you have, that I think is an important skill. Knowing about this whole process of how you uh, go from that uh, you know initial kernel of idea to the impact on the ground, not just a deployed system. And again, Rahul also was talking about, you know, the human systems, right? Finally, you have to interact with the human system. So how does this whole process evolve, right? That kind of curiosity should be there to just like know about all of these. And then the other thing is, it's not just that you just go in a one linear, like step one, step two, step three, and go on and get to your end goal, right? There's like typically a lot of iterative loops. And even after you've delivered the first one, you would want to go back and again, rebuild something, right? Because you want to evolve. So this kind of thinking is very important. And of course, like you might think, yeah, this makes sense for a um, you know, practitioner, but does this make sense for a researcher? I would say, by, yes, you know, it's even more important for a researcher because this holistic view of thinking through the whole life cycle, right? What will the customer experience be? How will the data be managed? How will, where will the data come from? And Kripal had a great question, right? And how would the engineering systems be deployed? Will it be like, you know, uh, feature phones or real phones? All of this is important because this opens up uh, these new research directions. I mean, like some of the great research directions that we've come across, like explainability of deep learning algorithms, tiny ML or resource constraint ML, federated learning, all of these are motivated uh, by the fact that, you know, yeah, there is a gap, like, because humans are in the loop and explainability is important because you, uh, yeah, I'm going on for so long because you're working with small devices and you need this. So I just wanted to say that, you know, it's important 
to have that kind of curiosity and develop that holistic view. The other thing I would say is like for uh, students, when we take in ML techniques, when we learn about them, we also know about their limitations. Why are we doing this? Under which assumptions will this work? And when will it fail, right? That's also an important one because I've seen a lot of cases where we abuse techniques uh, and you you know use them wrongly and when they don't fit in. And that's something I would say is important for people to just develop. Yeah, uh, it was a rather long answer and I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. Thank you, Sujana. Uh, would uh, Rahul or Anu would like to add uh, something regarding sure. from the point of view of an entrepreneur? Or... I can maybe add a, a, a little bit. Uh, so one is that when I think about, uh, you know, 25 years ago when we started, uh, you know, uh, I think at that point of time, I think our set of problems are very different. Uh, today's problems are different. And I think those who are students today, their problems five, 10 years later will be very different. Uh, the amount of, um, you know, what you can do with just, you know, not knowing, you know, language and all of that, I think all of that will get automated. A lot of things will get automated. Uh, but I think what will still remain is to find out, one, what are the human values that will uh, drive us to solve problems, uh, whether it is um, creativity, whether it's arts, whether it is trying to frame the question differently. I think those are the kind of uh, skills that will be greatly required. And the second thing is, of course, that when you think about, uh, you know, solving a particular problem, I think, you know, if you want to be an entrepreneur, then pick something that, you know, has a, you know, has a has an impact. If you want to be a researcher, then you you pick a, a problem that has maybe a longer term impact. So I think it depends on uh, what kind of problems excite you, and then then choose that problem to uh, solve for it. But I think remember that it's not just about uh, learning a technique, learning a particular you know, language, learning a particular way of solving problems, because in the end, the problems that will be thrown at you will be very different in real life than, than what they are today. Thank you. I know we are really short of time, so I would ask uh, each panelist to be very brief in this, one minute each, uh, any closing comments or thoughts on where we are going forward in uh, directions to the future. Uh, maybe I know you can start there and then we will because you're almost talking in that direction and then we will ask others uh, not more than one minute please yeah sure so i'll just one line um that uh, i think in the end no force can stop an idea whose time has come uh so i think you know when you look at machine learning and look at ai its time has come but we have to be responsible thank you anu uh rahul yeah i'll say to any students from triple id listening to this uh, if you're gradu going to graduate with a degree from Triple I Hyderabad, know that you're never going to starve in life. Okay? Therefore, if you find yourself fearing that, call your own BS. You're never going to starve in life. And therefore, um, in, in, in choosing to decide what you want to do, know that you have very little to lose. You will be safe in life. And so find the courage to actually go solve the big problems of our time. Thank you, Rahul. Very nice thought. Uh, Sujana, you want to add? Yeah, I will also keep it short. So, you know, I think, uh, uh, like Rahul said, you know, aim high. You are already at a top school. Aim high. You can do great things. They're like, you know, this phenomenal uh, things that are happening in the AI space. You've got geometric deep learning. You've got, like, you know, marriage of ML, physical sciences, creative arts. All of that's happening. The only thing I feel we need to be mindful of is that you know ai is it has the capacity to you know, not just anticipate the future we can control the future we can create new realities so we are like playing with fire in some sense we are like little kids playing with fire so while you learn about ai also make sure you try to understand more about its role in society and professor uh, you know in the very in his opening remarks uh, the director also had like mentioned this Let's, as a community and individually, try to figure out how we want to approach these methods, how do we want to use it, and, uh, you know, like, learn more about the role of AI in society and ethical questions. Yeah, and good luck to Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Sujana. We know yeah, so, the final Nothing to add to it. So I would say that, I mean, the AI, ML, I mean, what we are talking about here is possibly we are thinking in terms of traditional problems that may arise 
based on the society, but then we're also looking at things from uh, beyond typical computational problems uh, that could arise from say basic sciences. So this is where we could uh, think of chemistry, physics, biology as another area, which could possibly translate into a lot of applications that possibly of you know, importance also. So keep in mind that aspect also uh, going forward, because we are seeing that this is going to be possibly expand into uh, looking at how scientific research itself is being pursued, right? So, so my best wishes to all the students and also thank you panel members for joining us and possibly, you know, enlightening us with a lot more insights and possibly uh, we are all going to go with thoughts that you have put or planted in our mind. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Is a wonderful set of thoughts. You know, keep your head in the clouds and foot on the ground is uh, what in, in some short summary of the final thoughts that I would do. Thank you all the panelists. It was really, really wonderful to have you here. I wish we could go on forever, but uh, we are already crossed all the limits that was given on to me. Uh, thank you. Uh, hope to see you in person here sometime soon. Uh, over to you, Nimi. Uh, I'm unable to start my video. I've been blocked. Uh, never mind. Uh, but uh, okay. yes, uh, Anoop, uh, a great panel and wonderful moderation. And of course, the four stars that we have here today, uh, you, you just enthralled everybody. And I, I'm sure people who have been hearing you are, are taking away a lot of learnings. Uh, so thank you so much. Do forgive me if I've been a pest and have kept mailing you and did things like that. But it's all for a, for a great show such as today. So thank you so much. And uh, do be in touch. And we'll reach out to you uh, soon enough uh, to hear more from you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot. My profound thanks to all the panelists. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.